morning, everybody. So I would like to welcome all to this special grand rounds. April was actually officially designated as Diversity Month in 2004, a celebration time to recognize and honor the diversity surrounding us all. We are a little bit late this year, but it's always a good time to celebrate diversity. Today, we will have our third Robert H. Hayes, MD, endowed lectureship. Dr. Robert Hayes did his residency at UCSF and was an important ophthalmologist in Utah many years ago and a leader in Provo within the medical community. He tragically developed cancer and was gone, gone in a matter of months, right at the height of his career. His wife, Janet Hayes Beckham, set up a fund in memory of his love of teaching and mentorship. So our Robert H. Hayes MD lecturer today is a perfect representative of scholarship, humanity, teaching, and mentorship. Dr. Mildred Olivier is a renowned ophthalmologist and healthcare equity advocate who is currently the Associate Dean at Pons Health Sciences University at the St. Louis campus. She is also a professor of surgery and ophthalmology. There are so many other things to say about her that I actually had to select just a few. She was Assistant Dean for Diversity and Professor of Ophthalmology at Cook County in Chicago. She is the founder and CEO of Midwest Glaucoma Center. She served as member at large of the Board of Trustees of the AAU and is a past president of Women in Ophthalmology. She was chair of the Diversity Issues Committee and served on the Women in Eye and Vision Research Committee at ARVO. I met her in 2019, as we are both part of the program committee of the Envision Ophthalmology Summit meeting, which was created by Dr. Bonnie Henderson to empower women in ophthalmology. And this is a meeting that happens every year in February in Puerto Rico. Dr. Olivier's work has been recognized with honors like the American Glaucoma wow. Society Humanitarian Award and the AAO Secretariat Award, among many others. So Mildred, we know how busy you are, and I would like to thank you very much for making the time to come to Salt Lake City. And we have a certificate to give to you to mark your lecture today. Thank you so much. Nobody. There's a picture person. Thank you. Thank you so much. It really is a pleasure to be here today. Um, it is not my first time in this area, but it is my first time here at the Moran Eye Center. So I'm really excited to be here and even more excited to have a conversation about equity. Of all the forms of discrimination and e inequality, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and inhumane because it often results in death. Let's see, I didn't do my clicker here. These are my financial disclosures. But more importantly, I think it's important when we do talks like this to do disclaimers. Because there's a lot of difficult, it's a difficult and uncomfortable topic to discuss. There's complex feelings that often emerge, um, including guilt, anger, resentment, or defensiveness. You may perceive me as accusing you of being racist or sexist. You may feel that I have a specific political agenda or that I lack objectivity. As a health care professional and leaders, if we can't acknowledge and process these difficult emotions, then how can we expect other people to do so? As healthcare professionals who have not been taught about the connection between white supremacy, oppression, and injustice in health, we have to understand how we feel about certain things. And we've been socialized to believe that it's not polite to talk about racism, injustice, or oppression and the racial reckoning that wasn't. 
These are my educational objectives. So what is racism? It was first described in the 1400s and really as a justification for Portuguese enslavement of Africans. There's a social construct with very little biological relevance, and it's been used to establish hierarchical suppositions that affirm the supremacy of one racial group above another. Race is only a rough proxy of the social economic standards and culture and genes. Racism is a fundamental cause of disparities in healthcare. And racism is a system of structurally structuring opportunity and assigning value based on the social interpretation of how we physically appear. And I have this image here, and it's mainly just to kind of remind me that even up to several, just a couple of years ago, when they asked some medical students about, you know, race, I'm just trying to find out about racism, they still believe that blacks can tolerate more pain than white people. And this is not too long ago. So we still have a lot to work to do. And why this really happened? Well, all of us were through that, you know, um, Brianna Taylor, all that Black Lives Matter. And so it started a conversation again about things that have been going on for a very long time. And we can see from just that graph that initially people were like, okay, we got to do something. We're really, and then slowly over time, the discussion and um, thoughts about that are changing. And we know now that certain parts of the country really can't say diversity. Um, some of, in Texas, they've just gotten rid of the whole diversity offices, people not having jobs anymore. So there's a lot of conversation still going on, Supreme Court decisions. So all of this is still sort of lurking in the background. But we have to be able to name racism in order for us to really dismantle it. We can look at institutional or structural things, personal, personality, personally mediated, some internalizations, and we can examine these structures and policies and practices and norms. Kamara Jones gives a wonderful scenario about her uh, going into a new home, having uh, looking into the garden, wanting to uh, put flowers and stuff in her backyard, and there was a pot that was already had some soil in it, and then she wanted to put more flowers, so she got a beautiful uh, pot otherwise, and she started, she went to the store, they put some nice rich soils in it, and they planted the seeds, and, and so over time, she was kind of looking at these two pots. Well, the one that had been enriched with lots of soil, the flowers were nice and straight, and they were bright, they were red, and then the other ones were pink, but they were in soil that was not as enriched. And so she imagined that the pink little flower saying, wow, I want to be a red flower because the red flowers are probably better. Look at how strong they are. And the red flowers looking at the pink flowers, uh, flowers saying, oh, look at those little tweety little pinks. <laughs> they really can't get any better. We're the most beautiful here. And so she just kind of took that information to think, is that somehow how we may think about things? People that are entitled come in saying, hey, I'm great, I'm good, everything is wonderful, but people who aren't might feel uh, the imposter syndrome, inferiority. And so these are things that we can think about when we go out into the universe and we try to be more equitable. So the definitions, well, disparities, a health difference based on one or more health outcomes that adversely affects defined disadvantaged populations. And equity, the presence of avoidable avoidable systemic, systematic differences in health and social justice, system where public and institutional practices, cultural representations, and other norms work in reinforcing ways to perpetuate racial group inequities. And I worked at um, Cook County Hospital, and uh, I know Kevin's going there <laughs> next year, which I'm happy about. But, you know, I remembered even that's so structural, patients coming in late. And you're like, oh, you're late, your appointment's done. <laughs> Not really understanding some of the social barriers that made it so they had to, how they got there that day. The bus didn't show up, you know, and then the next connection bus didn't, then they had to walk three miles there. And so a lot of times, I, if it was in glaucoma, I would say, you know, if somebody's late, let me know. And I would find out and talk to the person and say no. And usually they knew I was going to say that was okay. And we would work that person in. 
But that's the structural uh, infrastructure that really is poor there. And so we have to think about those social determinants of health. What are the barriers and facilitators? We can look at economic stability in terms of employment and income, expenses, how much debt, what are the medical bills in that area? What about the neighborhood? What about how it physically, the physical environment is? Is there housing? Is there transportation? <clears throat> oh, excuse me. Are there nice green parks? Are there parks that they can go out and play in? I remember as a kid, I used to play on the streets, but now it's dangerous to be outside sometimes in your own neighborhoods. And the playgrounds, can you walk around? What's your zip code? Does it matter what your zip code is in terms of how you're going to be treated? What about the education? Is there high, is there literacy, language? What is the language of the area? You know, early childhood ed education. Are there Montessori schools or educational opportunities for people to really be ready when they get into high school, et cetera, even college? Is there higher education opportunities? Food security, we know in many, many low marginalized countries, there are more McDonald's than there are fresh vegetables. And so we have to look at those, what can we do to make those things different if you have diabetes? And what is your access to healthy options? The community safety, social integration, support systems, community engagement, exposure to violence and trauma, do you have to worry about when you're walking outside in your area? or policing or justice policies? And of course, a healthcare system. Is there health coverage? Uh, a pharmacy, availability of pharmacy. Your doctor writes a prescription for you and you go to the pharmacy and they say, oh, it's gonna take us three weeks to fill that for you. And so you don't have it. So when you go back for your three to four week appointment, you say, I couldn't get that medication. So pharmacies have to have it. And one of the pharmacies in my area where I am in St. Louis, they were telling me some of the problems they had getting certain medications for their patients, especially the ones that were on Medicaid. And then they said, you know, it's just too costly for us. We're not even going to put it on formulary anymore uh, to do those deliveries. And are there access to linguistically and culturally appropriate and respectful care? And what is that quality of care? Well, what's the issue? Do new medications or devices and surgical procedures allow for equal access for those who are underrepresented? Does underrepresentation in research and overrepresentation in incidence and prevalence of disease have a role? Uh, Dr. Edie Miller and I got the first uh, grant uh, of IRIS grant for the American Glaucoma Society, and we were looking at um, changes or differences in MIGs and cataract surgery in different populations. Well, first we had a huge issue because, you know, people don't really put demographic data always on the chart. And so that was an issue. And then we wanted to know, does putting a mix, is that different in a black person than in a Hispanic person than Asian uh, person or Pacific Islanders? And it was really hard to really talk about um, that even having such a huge iris uh, registry data. But what we do know, if we just look at breast cancer, 41% higher death rates in African-American or black women than white women. But in the clinical studies, only 6% are represented there in cancer clinical research. Of the global population, participants in clinical research, only 8%, 80% of which are Caucasian. 91% of the genomic databases consist of patients from European ancestry. And we use this data when we talk about to our patients. I remember initially, even for like glaucomas, the visual fields, I kept saying sometimes, you know, well, there's only about 200 black people in this database. <laughs> but yet, here I am using, oh, you're getting worse. I mean, how do I really know that? We have to build those databases to include people that we're really talking about. Certainly, there's a global awareness on disparities in clinical research and what its impl implications are. And the FDA has really looked at enhancing diversity in the clinical trial populations and have criteria for that. And it's great that from 2005 to 2017, there's scientific population, uh, publications on health disparities increased by 600%. Even our RAV Venable program, we see more and more every year residents and medical students really talking about 
I'm looking into health disparities. I'm from Ponce, I mean, at the medical school, and one of our Puerto Rican students uh, said he wanted to look at really what the prevalence and incidence of glaucoma was in Puerto Rico. There really isn't a lot of data on that. And so usually it takes people who have concordance with the population to even start to think about what questions might there be that I want to answer that other people are not. And certainly um, the European Medicine Agency as well, looking into clinical trials, considering inter-ethnic differences. Well, what are the diversities in the clinical trials? We know that NIH has been really great about this and really trying to include women and minority groups in all of the NIH-funded clinical research. And we know that many of us who have had NIH funding, you have to make a statement and you have to kind of say what the distribution is. And I think that is the only way that we're gonna really get more information. And we know through the Office of Women's Health that certainly has told us a lot about how cardiovascular disease presents differently in gender between men and women. We would not know that if we didn't really try to collect that data. The primary goal of the law is to really ensure that the research findings can be generalized to the entire population. And that stature, what are the differences in sex, gender, race, and ethnicity? Well, pigmentation matters. We know in glaucoma, certainly iris pigment absorption in the active drug makes less bioavailability. We know that we can see that between Timol quarter percent and half percent, and we know that you need increasing the percentages of pilocarpine, the darker the iris is. But what we did learn, what we knew before, people did know this before about the pulse oximeter, but in COVID, that's really when it came out. And the FDA has done several now workshops all day long with experts trying to debate the fact that the pulse oximeter function differentiated itself when people had darker pigmentation. So it overestimated the arterial oxygen saturation by 3% in patients with dark pigments. And so many patients who went to the emergency room and they checked their saturation, they were like, oh, you're okay, end up going home and dying because really the information was not accurate. And they're still trying to figure out how can we adjust for those changes so that we don't make those mistakes anymore. And so therefore, Again, a disparity in the way we treat different patients. We see that with Paxlovid, the inequity, racial and ethnic groups in outgoing settings showed that 20 to 36% of minority patients were less likely to prescribe the Medicaid, to be prescribed the medication. Out of 700,000 patients recruited in 30 sites, and there was only a, uh, an increase from the drug when it came out in January of 2022 to July of 2022 from 0.6 to 34%. But blacks were 35.8% less likely to be prescribed the medications as compared to other ethnic groups. Hispanics, 29.9%, mixed race, 24%, even less in the uh, Native American. And I, you know, I say, uh, well, I thought things were bad for black patients, but when you look at the Native Americans, it really is horrible. And there's a lot of work to be done in that community. Even if somebody was immunocompromised, they still were less likely to get this medication. And as I talked to some of my um, friends who were even physicians who got COVID, and uh, you know, I said, well, did they offer you Plexivid? And they said, no. And I said, oh. so every time I ran into somebody, I'd say, make sure you ask your doctor for this. The fact that it wasn't even offered to them was a problem. But when I queried some of my white patients, uh, my white friends, that wasn't the case. They're like, oh, yeah, I started that last night. The doctor told me. So there's so many inequities. And it's not like we want to do that as physicians, but somehow it still occurs. I commend the AAO task force and really putting out a wonderful series of um, publications that has to do with disparities in vision, healthcare, and eye care. 42 million people with visual impairments and blindness. Uh, we know it's gonna increase to almost 7 million by 2050. Uh, visual acuities of 2200 and central vision, 20% um, in the better eye. 
but we know that minority populations have a higher risk of ocular diseases, visual impairment, and blindness. Older individuals as well are more at risk and disproportionately so. And there are sex and gender differences. And again, Hispanic or older patients or others who are less likely to be just prescribed low vision um, devices. I know even in glaucoma, it's hard to keep to remember that sometimes we have to say to patients, there are low vision macular retina things. There are low vision devices. And many of us don't do that. We have to remember to be able to offer that to our patients because it can make a difference. The task force looked at uh, epidemiology, the race and ethnicity, socioeconomics, uh, geographic location, the age, the sex and gender in all of these different eye diseases. So as I said, I'm from also the Chicago area. In the Chicago area, if I look at these two areas, Englewood versus Streeterville, they're only 10 miles apart from each other. We talked about does zip code really matter? Well, in this situation, it does. And you can see that the life expectancy for the one is 60 years of, of age versus 90 years of age in Streeterville. The medium income, 19,800 in the Englewood versus over 100,000 in the Streeterville. And you can see the distribution of black and white, how that's so very different. And so where you live makes a big difference as to what your disparities are gonna be. And I just put up this um, chart again by, for terms of life expectancy. And what we see now is that the Hispanic female is the one that lives longer. So I mentioned before the IRIS registry, which is wonderful because it does give us data. And certainly what we need is data. It's the nation's first comprehensive eye disease. It's HIPAA compliant. The practices don't have to do anything to do anything about it, but we know that it only encompasses a few academic institutions, and that's where a lot of our patients are also seen. Um, so there are other um, people looking to see how we can get some of the data from academic institutions so we can add to that. And it's got over uh, 77 million patients in there. As I said before, when we got this um, MIGS cataract, we looked in mostly males uh, who were black, who had mild to moderate glaucoma, and it was most of the MIGS was put into by non-glaucoma specialists with cup to disc ratios in the patients who were over 60, between 0.5 and 0.8. Most of those people got it in the Midwest region. And the utilization of MIGS, we knew, went really from 2013 to 2017, went from 5.2% to almost 15% in that population of groups. But we want to know, you know, did they get less medications? Did they have visual field progression? What was their, you know, imaging studies like? But a lot of that information we cannot get from the IRIS registry. So we have to think of other ways of doing that. And so what are some of the other maybe databases that we can think about or use? IRS Registry, Veterans Affairs data sets exist, site over uh, outcomes, research collaborations are there. The CDC has a vision and eye health surveillance system. The All of Us research program that's uh, put out by NIH, University of Chicago has its too, but we have to really look at all payers. Can we get claim databases? Uh, Medicare, Medicaid, we have to be able to see how we can pull that information to see if we can get better data and identify what we can or can't do. So what is the problems? There certainly are problems with data. Uh, Medicare data does not include individuals who have lack of access to healthcare resources. There's no social determinants of health information there in terms of you know, sometimes your race, ethnicity, gender, and so on, food security. We need to improve uh, data. Certainly we can incorporate, we have to incorporate academic institutions like this institutions and many others. We have to train staff and physicians to assure that the information that we need is collected and who needs yet another thing to do when you're sitting in front of a patient. But we have to somehow be able to get that data to make a difference if we really want to see why we can or how we can really decrease disparities in at least um, ophthalmic diseases. And maybe we can use some of those diseases, like, I mean, bad databases like all of us. And we know that now Epic does have a module for social determinants of health. And as my other girlfriend says, I don't have time to do that. <laughs> Somebody else is gonna have to do that. 
but we have to figure out who can and how we can get that. We need a common database standards and models and see how we can integrate these things. And um, then we can hopefully standardize and validate the surveys that we collect. And we have to have community engagement with the ophthalmologists that are out in the community, oftentimes, especially in underserved or under-resourced areas are where many of the black ophthalmologists are with their black patients. So we have to figure out how to incorporate. And I think more and more as we look at sometimes some of the stuff that the CDC is doing, they are really looking for um, innovative ways of uh, being able to partner with the community, either with pharmacists or, or um, other physicians in those areas that are seeing the patients so we can better understand what that means. Well, I have to say for glaucoma, we don't do so bad in doing that. When we look at the major uh, clinical trials that we've had, Aegis, Oetsigis, et cetera, we can see that we have a fairly, you know, usually our mark is about hopefully 25%, at least of the database has blacks or uh, African-Americans in there. We can see that in the has Hispanic population that becomes less, but uh, but we see that range all the way goes from 3.6 to 6.2 or, or 14 and the TVT, and then less and less, as I say, for other races, and again, the Native American, even less. But at least we had some in the OAT study. But this is important as we look at trials or we're looking at research to make sure we can have representation for different ethnic groups, because it's only then that we'll be able to decide, you know, how can we do better. Primary open angle glaucoma, we know that African Americans are five to six more likely to have glaucoma and eight to 10 times more likely to go blind from the disease. And uh, POAG can appear 10 years earlier, progress more rapidly, and it is the leading cause of irreversible blindness in this population. You now, I go to Haiti and I can say that I think even I've seen um, in Haiti, glaucoma is really um, affects much younger people. I think it's probably a very different disease. It was, uh, it, it was not unlikely that I would see somebody that was in their 20s or 30s, very strong family history that was already blind at that age. And the pressures weren't just like 22, 25, they were like 45. And you know, what do you do in these kinds of uh, areas um, that have, um, really high blindness rates. Uh, what procedure is best? Again, the more we know about how that affects even maybe us in the United States and what we use may help us um, to decide. What's the prevalence? Well, we know that uh, the St. Lucia study, the Baltimore Eye study, and Barbados study gave us the prevalence of glaucoma. And the uh, LALOS or the Los Angeles Latino Eye study also, which has mostly Mexicans in it, but also gives us what that rate of prevalence is. Well, that was glaucoma. What about responses in terms of retina? Well, the impact on race, on short-term treatment, uh, receiving injections for uh, diabetic macular edema, blacks experience lower odds of visual improvement compared to white and Hispanic following the treatment. And um, in using the IRIS database, they were able to see that uh, black and Hispanic presented with worse baseline uh, diabetic retinopathy severity. And among those uh, with diabetes, the prevalence of diabetic retinopathy was almost 33% in the Hispanic population and 26.5% in the black population compared to that 18% in the white population. Again, Native Americans had the highest prevalence of diabetic retinopathy with 45.3% compared to their non-Native American populations. Blacks had increased risk of developing moderate to severe retinopathy when compared to Caucasians, and Blacks and Hispanics have increased insulin resistance. Well, where do we go from here? We need data. We talked to, I mean, that's all I've been saying today. Data, 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 data. We need to continue and acknowledge and pilot uh, interventions that really need to address what these social uh, determinants of health are, including systemic, system, systemic, systemic racism. We need to build infrastructures to identify what are mod modifiable, what can we do? And some of the areas they've decided, you know, um, they will take Uber Eats and deliver healthy foods to patients in their, populate, in their uh, hospitals that have diabetic retinopathy and can't get healthy foods. 
We have to think about how we can engage with the community and elevate their voices to help us be able to see what can we do to make this better. We want to formulate ways to increase underrepresented populations, and we want them in clinical trials. I think this is the other area. So there's like the mistrust. Many of them remember Tuskegee and what happened, and um, you know, and even uh, Hispanic female population in terms of fertile, you know, um, doing procedures that were not uh, consented for. So there's a real trust issue. And so sometimes having somebody who's concordant like yourself, or maybe you're not concordant, the fact that you understand culturally competent individuals who are trained can hopefully um, convince some of those patients that we do need them in clinical trials. It's one thing to go out there and for them to say no. We have to ask, but then we also want them to participate. And we have to do a better job at that. We want to increase diverse populations so we can prove the scientific understanding, particularly about how various ophthalmic conditions ultimately improve the standard. We know that there are many barriers to recruitment and possible solutions. As I said, the implicit biases, the costs and time and the commitment. But we have to create new points in the databases to get the information. We educate ourselves about why we do need the data do unconscious training, not enough to just check it off the checkbox at the beginning of the year. It has to be continual. We have to be constantly reminded. Um, even I have to look every time I talk to patients to say, am I really giving all the information that I should be given to this patient, even if I am concordant with them? Because we want to improve eye care and create a continuous improvement system. That's always compliance, very important. So I love this slide because it really shows what some of the things I'm trying to say. Inequality, we see here that the trees kind of bound many more apples on the one side than the other. So the other guy, the little guy can't get as many apples. Equity, we say, you know what? We're gonna give a higher ladder to the other guy so he could reach those apples, but there aren't any, any, as many apples on the tree. Equality, we say, you know, we just give them both the same Ladder, they should deal with it as you can, hear all the tools. But justice, that's where we wanna be. The tree is straight, apples are on both sides. Everybody's given the uh, tools to be successful, to be able to reach their target, and that's what's important. So we um, have a couple of programs. Uh, some of you have also, I mean, I think here, some of the residents have come from these programs. I know Dr. Carter, Keith Carter, I think, talked about the MOM program for the academy, and this really gives the opportunity for a medical students early on in their career, and maybe sometimes undergraduates if they have enough funding, to be able to do some research grants, away rotations, and get, e get ready for match prep. And the research, uh, they can apply for this. They had grants. My understanding is that their funding is a little tight on this, so they might have uh, recently removed being able to do that, but we have to see if we can get them early and competitive to be able to um, be competitive to get into the residency programs, frankly. And they might have to go away, wrote away and it costs a lot of money to uh, visit a lot of programs that you might wanna do that, but also trying to get them ready for the match prep. And then this, uh, there were 16 students who had submitted applications and they were supported in many different ways. What can you do to increase diversity? Well, there's you as the you, and me and I. There's in terms of the organization. Uh, some, of course, some now not having diversity officers, but some do. Uh, but really um, touching base with that diversity person to see what can be done. Educate the membership, your faculty about why it's important to build a better product. The more people you have with more diverse ideas, the better product you do. The better outcomes you're gonna have, the less hopefully health disparities we're gonna have. And it's good to have somebody who's a naysayer because they give their point and then you can give your point. Um, but again, all of that means that we build a better brand and product. Um, we need to increase diversity on our boards, looking at our, commu and our committees. Are, is there a good representation when you're going to give a lecture series? Is there a balance? Can you invite somebody uh, like myself or other people to, uh, to broaden our education as to what's going on in that area? To view this as not a short-term process, but a long-term process. And we have to do the action is 
now that every organization really needs to collect the data um, in terms of, uh, you know, I was just thinking like, as you look at APOST or ASOPERS, I mean, ASOPERS I think has less than 10, I wanna say six black oculoplastics in it. You know, if you look at these different spe specialties, you know, how many people look like me that are in there? We have things to say, we have voices and we wanna be able to use them and educate everybody. Every medical education entity should you know, look at those analysis and, and decide what can be done. Um, Patrice, Patrice Harris was the first black female um, physician to lead the AMA in all of its years. And they had one black male as well. Now we're, we've, uh, at the academy, we've had Dr. Tamara Fountain and uh, Dr. Keith Carter who are excellent, but happen to be black. And so we want to look at those things. And these, of course, are some of the faces of the people that have been in the MOM program, which is not only with the American Academy of Ophthalmology, but also the AUPO as well. And so we have a uh, couple things here, for because I'm always like, if you're going to talk about something, at least try to give some kind of solution or innovation or something that you want to do. It's not like, what are the problems? But this was just one way. Uh, that I could make an impact. And so for the Rav Venable program, Dr. Edie Miller and myself are the co-directors. We've been doing it for 20 years. We have an NIH grant for it, a travel grant to bring students to students, residents, fellows. And now we're trying to also kind of work on some junior faculty stuff, but the AUPL now I think has the Inspire program for that. But we've been doing that. And so, you know, initially it was like eight students, you know, 99% perhaps match rate. But the real impact is now when we've had over 150 students that apply to the RAV Venable program, picking their um, the best abstracts and posters and having them present to the annual meeting there. And we have people that are observers. If it's your first time, you can come and you can see what you need to do, but you can't come back a second time without doing a research project. Um, so that we can um, mentor people also to think about going into academic medicine because there's not a lot of us in academic medicine either. And so sometimes the same people are the ones that everybody is. So, you know, you have to really sort of build that pathway. So we've been able to do that and we're happy about that. And so now we have maybe 50 people applying to ophthalmology. And so if we can get 80% of those into the system, that's really where we can now start really making that impact. And I think we have six of those of people who've gone through the RAV Venable program that have R01 grants now. So that's exciting, but it's taken us 20 years to do that. It's not overnight. We have the pillar program that we started now in conjunction with um, Stanford. And literally it was Jeff Goldberg calling me one day and saying, I wanna do something, what can I do? And so we talked about how we can collaborate together and we thought about the, the way the HEAD fellowships are put together. And we said, you know, how about sort of a HEAD type program, but for underrepresented uh, residents. And so we do that now every September to be able to do that. Because really when we looked at the academy, looked at the numbers, we were pretty much flatlined for most black ophthalmologists about two to 5% of the whole AAO membership. And so my thing now is I went through executive leadership in academic medicine, ELAM, and my project there was to do uh, my last little section, which is mini medical school, which we gear towards fourth graders. I have now two classes have gone through the Chicago Medical School program. We just, in fact, uh, next weekend is the graduation for Ponce, where we target um, fourth graders. We go out to the community, we pick two schools, um, that are in underserved resources, but we ask uh, areas, but we ask the superintendents and the principals to get really the brightest and the best that they have in that. And we've enrolled about, uh, in St. Louis, we have 10 from each school, so we have 20 students and any of our faculty members who have students that are, are uh, children that are in that age group, we also allow them to enroll them into the mini medical school. And it runs from like September through May, and every Saturday they go and they do CPR. And in fact, in my other medical school, um, 
one of the students, her grandfather was having like an MI and literally collapsed. And she was like, call 911, start CPR. <laughs> and so by the time the paramedics got there, they were like, oh my God, like what's going on with this kid? And the parents realized like how important that mini medical school had been for them. And she really started to intervene and she was able to start the CPR. And so that's impactful because whether she goes in or not, the fact is that we've educated her and her parents as to how important STEM is. And so now we, and then we also have a separate section for parents, guardians, and educators. Because a lot of times when you hear stories from people like me, it is that along the way, many people told us we should not be physicians. And so we don't want people to be in the fourth grade and interested. And that's when their minds are like, you can really talk to them and they're still excited and they're going to think, well, whatever. So, um, you know, it's important for them not to say no or you can't do it to these young minds. So we educate them. And we also educate them as, you know, like they have to be able to study hard. Grades are important. These are important. Maybe we'll put a uh, summer camp together for them, but we have to continually take them from the fourth grade to the fifth grade. We have to, until we can pass the baton to a high school program, and that program can pass the baton to a higher education program to keep them interested and excited about it. So I want to, these are some of my contributors and I want to thank them. I also have some books that might be uh, interesting to read if people want to know a little bit more about um, just this topic in general. And otherwise, I want to thank you today for listening to just a small smidget <laughs> of um, my work has been in diversity and the work that still needs to be continued to be done. And I'm very excited about listening to other people's viewpoints or suggestions or comments. Uh, these are my references. Thank you. Gives us some time for comments. <laughs> so uh, thank you so much, Mildred. And I have two points. So the first one, what I wanted to let everybody know is our discussion yesterday, because you, in your list of books, there is the book past the origin of our discontents by Isabel Wilkerson. So if you do not read the book, in a Delta flight, you can see the movie Origin which is based on this book and it's super interesting. So I just happened to see by chance my last five. And the second thing is that I wanted you to expand a little bit on the Rav Venable program, because I'm not sure if it is like the AU minority mentorship program where some faculty could just apply to be a mentor. Is that the same thing? Pretty much I would say that the MOM program and the uh, Rav Venable program are almost the same in lots of things in terms of we're always looking people to mentor. I think people need all kinds of mentors, people who look like you, people who don't look like you, people who are may, maybe a different gender than you. So I think having mentors, and I'll tell you, I went into glaucoma because of Eve Higginbotham. <laughs> you know, I literally was in the library one day at U of I, you know, trying to do research, trying to get ophthalmology, and she tapped me on the shoulder. She's like, what do you want to do? So I want to be an ophthalmologist. <laughs> and she was like, what are you doing here? And she was like, no. And I literally, on the next plane, there I went to Harvard uh, in a lab there, and I got three publications, you know, doing that. And at the same time, there were, I think it was either Tufts or um, they had a similar program. So I was able to go there, and they paid for me to kind of be in the area. And I was ex able to extend my stay, do the research, be there for a good three months. So mentorship matters a lot. And so if anyone wants to mentor, I think that's important. The other thing is that the mom program really looks at first and second, really first year people, where they can really make an impact and then take them up through you know, the fourth year. The Rav Venable program, we will take anyone at any age because many of us are through the process. Many of us didn't really decide on ophthalmology till the very end. Nobody in my school or when I was training said, hey, why don't you become an ophthalmologist? It happened that one of my classmates whose father was an ophthalmologist, I was trying to give a talk on diabetic retinopathy in my third year. And um, 
he said, oh, why don't you use these slides? At the time, the Academy had all those sort of slide decks that, you know, had, and that's what he had. And that's what he gave me. And I was like, oh my God, like what specialty is this? How come nobody's told me about it? So they don't tell us, why don't you be a neurosurgeon? Why don't you be an ophthalmologist? You know, they go, primary care is where you should be. Not that we don't need primary care. I think we need black uh, dermatologists. Like we just need everything in every specialty uh, when it comes to us. But, you know, so the mentorship is, is there. We are starting to do for the Rap Benipol program, we've let them try to find research opportunities. Um, but I think I always, we try to tell them because of NIH too, can we find somebody who has already has a grant? Can they put them on as a supplemental? You know, there are other ways of trying to do that. So I would say the difference really is that we just accept everybody because we realize there's a different, um, people are different stages, but the um, mom program does early. And actually I was on the board of the American Academy of Ophthalmology when you were supposed to do some project at the end. You know? And I thought, what the heck am I gonna do? And so that's how I came up with the idea of the mom program. And I went to David Park and I said, look, we got a problem here. And actually at the time, I think uh, Bobby Copeland had just died from Howard being the chair at Howard and somebody else. And I was like, there's so many of us that are dying. There's only 250 of us. And if we keep losing all the people who you know, are older, what are we gonna have? We're not really building up. We need, I need allies and the academy has the opportunity and the resource to do that. And lucky for me, David was said, okay. I said, it's gonna cost you some money, David. <laughs> but, uh, but then, you know, partnering with the AUPL, which I think is another thing. And then Keith took on some more and, and so on. So those are the things. So if any of you wanna be mentors where, uh, or you have research opportunities, I think the one great thing about the Rab Menable program is the fireside chats, which I think you guys are also on there and um, certainly Jeff knows he's talked uh, to our group as well but you know that's really where programs have been able to see who our um, students and medical students are and had a relationship with them and none of them really before when I said Utah they had no idea there was like a residency program I mean it was just not in their you know mental so now they know this place exists, they can apply to it, they can come here. Um, there are programs that are really interested in trying to diversify, understand the, uh, you know, why that's important. It's a long way of answering your question. There's one here and then there. Teaches the students in the mini medical school on Saturdays. All right, so mini medical school, I actually empower my medical students to be, they are the executive committee. I'm there, you know, I have a faculty member helping them and I'm there in the background, but I want them. They have to talk to the programs, figure out what letters they need, what kind of checklist they need for the graduations coming up. And yesterday I was like, where's the program? <laughs> you know? And so they are the executive committee. And then they have to also do that community engagement, right? Go out there and find and continually talk to the superintendents. And it's great for them. And they have to talk at a fourth grade level which is really what sometimes they need for their patients. And the, so when they say, do you have an arrhythmia to the, to the little fourth graders? I go, what the heck do they think that means? You know? So they have to explain. And so that's a great way for them to be leaders and also to communicate. So I, one of the big problems I think we continue to face is smashing of whole poverty in like the fourth, fifth, and sixth grades where people are feel as though they have the potential to pursue and move further, further, and I, I think that continues to be a major problem. What, what, what can we do to help with that disparity between people raised, you know, of equal potential, but one in which, of course, I'm going to go on. I'm going to be post grad in the others. That's not even in my future. So somehow, we have to help open that vision. And I'm not sure we're still doing a very good job. Well, I don't think we are, but I think, that, as I think of this is a great place for the academy. I mean, we have all those members out there. It's just one of those people, if you just went back to your community or that high school, I'm sure there's, you know, uh, facilities or educational opportunities in your community that you can go and just talk about eye importance and being a physician and getting, you know, eyeballs and cutting our cheap hearts. You, that would be 
like easy all at one time, right? Just every academy member take one spot in your area and go out there and do. And then after that, then we have to, I mean, like this mini medical school, it's great because they see people that look like them and we have all very diverse group. And they're like, if they can do that, I can do that. And so that, just that connection of maybe everybody else in your life tells you you can't do it, but somebody sees an opportunity in you where you can be better. And that often is just the little light that somebody needs to continue. But we have to, it has to be sustained. But I think if we could just do that, that would help. <laughs> the, uh, I mentioned this last night that we have this kind of uh, outsized Polynesian community. We also have the Native American community here. And you know, for, for us in Utah, those are the communities that, that don't have relative representation in medicine, but we have access to. And so one of the new deans on lower campus, uh, she, uh, she, she is working on creating actually kind of mirroring a pipeline program that, that we did at Ohio State when I was in medical school. The same idea, you, you find these you know, young kids, 40 students, great students, and you just expand the horizon of, oh yeah, and medicine is possible too. Uh, I, I remember being really struck uh, uh, in medical school, just saw a flyer, went and started, uh, I, think, I think they called it tutoring science in middle school. I thought I could tutor medical, middle school science. So I showed up, these were all like much, much better students than I ever were. They were intelligent, knew their stuff, Oro students, and just in those conversations, exactly zero of them thought about going into medicine. And it was, and that was just that aha, like, you know, hit you like a ton of bricks moment that you know, they just got to realize this is a, this is an opportunity, this is a possibility. And, and that, that's where the, uh, the Ohio State's pipeline program, MD Camp was born, still, still occurring this day. Mubarak's younger sister went to it. It's, um, and then, yeah, I, I think you're spot on, Randy. It's simply a matter of engaging. We're not trying to get everybody to be a doctor, right? <laughs> I mean, it's not going to happen to everybody. But if we can get them in the healthcare, what's a perfusionist? What does a technician in the OR do that's when they're doing cardiac? You know, I could be a nurse. I could be a respiratory therapist. I could be an ophthalmic technician. These are just things to broaden their horizon. Yes, you're not, but you can be in healthcare. I mean, I was saying that I had a back surgery like a year ago, and I entered that healthcare system, and it is so bad. I was like... This system is really broken. The communication between people, you know, not happening. Doctor's notes are over here. Nurse's notes are over there. I was like, did you look at the chart? <laughs> so there was so many things. I don't think we see it as much being mostly outpatient in ophthalmology, but you go into that inpatient system and, you know, people not even the, I had a roommate <laughs> and, you know, she really didn't understand every time when the doctors were coming in. Uh, talking about the rounds and what was wrong. She just didn't understand. So we have a lot of things to fix. Um, it won't be fixed overnight, but we can, we certainly need to put more people in the system so we can have more conversations and figure out what we can do to make it better. It's got to get better. Thank you.